Yo, 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 yo. What's up, all you burner stoners and potheads, and especially all you gardeners out there? This is Mr. Weed Man and Big Earl with the Weed Man 420 Chronicles, the Grow Hour. How are all you gardeners doing out there this evening? Big Earl, my brother, how the hell are you? What's up, man? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Good, man. We were just talking before we started the show about all the fun stuff you're going to be growing. Made me smile. I can't. I love the pictures you've been posting on your Insta at Earl217, and I am the real Regal Beagle, man. Some of those, I got some comments on that, uh, on Show Your Grow Fridays of that one you, you snapped, and, and I posted, man. People were going, wow. And I have to say, wowzers. I mean, phenomenal, phenomenal, terpy-looking, trichome, crystally, beautiful just colas and just oh just amazing so thank you for sharing out there so uh but we're gonna smoke real quick because it is my favorite time of the show (laughs) only kidding but my favorite time of the show is when i get to smoke with my friend and i am smoking happy hour grown by you but who uh who bred that bad boy or bad girl i should say so that actually is one of the few that wasn't my selection but it was by Soul Fire, uh, Fire, and it was just floating around the area. And I had a friend said, "You got to, you got to grow this." Fantastic smoke, fantastic, very upper, uh, not super fun. It grows very big leaves, very tall on the plant. So naturally, I bred it, hit it with some pollen, and then we're gonna see what we can get out of it. You know. I will say this: it's very light and fluffy, and and very very sticky. It's, it reminds me of an old school bud I used to get back when I lived down in Florida uh, called the O bud that used to come from Oregon back in the 90s. We used to get it was very special. We, we, get, we hardly ever saw it, but when we did, it was like we never sold it. We just kept it for ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> it reminded me a lot of that. I don't – like I said, we just call it the O, and uh, but just so nice and just the smell is so just fragrant. And uh, it's a beautiful strain. I love it. It is very, very – uppity strain oh very good thinking strain very like get shit done kind of strain talkative strain so but well done my friend on that love smoking i still got two nice nugs what are you smoking tonight i rolled up the sour poo um it got that name just from its parents but it's uh just very sour uh one of the autos um that i made a while ago and uh one of my favorites. I haven't worked with it again yet, but I'm going to for sure. Well, when you mean sour, do you mean like sour, like a warhead type of sour or like tart, like sour? Like when I hear that, I've never, I, I, I because I have such bad taste buds because I was a big time smoker for a long time. My taste buds are shot in a way. Uh, I get hints of stuff now and then, but I never taste the full flavor of something. And Mrs. Weedman, who had great taste buds, have lost her taste a little bit because of the medication she's tasting. So I never really get the full effects of how cannabis, marijuana, weed, flour, whatever you call it, tastes like, unfortunately. So it's very frustrating. So when you mean sour, give me the explanation of like what you mean by sour to you. Like I said, is it like a warhead or is it different? So it's it's. It is kind of like a warhead, but it is different too. To me, um, I think people have a hard time explaining the GMO for the same reason. Not that it tastes anything like this, but the sour isn't necessarily the taste on the smoke. It's the taste that's left on your lips, on your tongue. When you touch like the top of your mouth, you get this like covering in your mouth and it's just a sour taste. Gotcha. I feel like GMO, a lot of people can't, can't explain GMO and a lot of those crosses. And it's because it's not like an upfront flavor. You know, it's like when you get that hot sauce and you're like, oh, that's not too bad. And then it hits the back of your throat and you're like, whoa. Yeah. Not, you know, and it's kind of like that, but with, you know, not as intense, as, you know, but um, so that's what I think of when I think of sour, you know, and it, but it definitely like puckers you a little bit and you feel it. It, it. it tastes like you ate the Sour Patch Kid, you know, 30 seconds ago. Gotcha. Kind of okay. sour, like it's still kind of sitting around. Yeah. All right. It makes sense now. All right. Like I said, I I know what sour is. I just don't have the best taste buds like I used to when it comes to like drinking certain drinking like wine. Someone tells me they get all these flavors. I'm like, yeah, I just get oak. (laughs) I get one. I don't get the multiple flavors or the the real long lasting flavors anymore. I just get like one quick flavor and it's just like, okay, I got it. But there's so much more complexity to a lot of different things. Wine, beer, cannabis, you know, candy you know whatever you are you partake in 
there's flavors to it and not everybody has a good palate to understand flavors unfortunately like myself and i'm bummed my partner in crime she doesn't have the 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 flavor the flavors like she used to it kind of sucks uh very bummed out she would tell me what stuff tastes like so you know so but this 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 happy hour tastes very nice it's smooth i guess when i when i smoke weed now because i don't have i don't get all the flavors like that orange soul you bred you grew i get the flavors on that because that's very very orange blossomy especially the smell i still have a good nose i just don't have good taste buds um but i don't it's very frustrating sometimes you know but this happy hour is very nice the high is there it, and i guess when i talk about it the smoothness of a smoke i guess is more what i'm all about like if i smoke a rough bud like flower and it makes me like uh, uh, or cough a lot or or like hack up a lung. It's not because I took too big of a hit because it was a rough smoke. I like a very clean, good smoke, you know, and this is going to lead up into what we're talking about here in a minute. This is why I'm talking this. So I like a very smooth, clean smoke. And that's how I know the weed has been cured right or taste right or should the way it should feel when you smoke it. If weed is rough, if it makes you hack, if it makes you clear your throat a lot that means it hasn't been cured right which i'm leading up into our next show topic our title and this is the final stage of the grow this is your final this is what we we've been leading up to everybody we've had on the show everybody we uh big girl and i's talks just him and i and everybody we've had this leads to your final thing now you have it all you got it the flower is the buds are there you're eight to 12 weeks or 16 weeks no matter how long you've had your 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 stuff in in flower it's ready you know the trichomes are there they have that depending on where you want it on the stage but i like mine where they just have that little tinge of amber that's it just a tinge or you want cloudy trichomes is what you're looking for when you know it's possibly ready or you're 100 percent sure it's ready you know by looking with the jeweler's loop or or however way you look at your your cannabis uh while it's growing on the on the tree you're looking at those tr those trichomes and the coloration. If it's if it's clear, it is not ready. If it's cloudy, it's most it's ready. But if you like it just a little bit with that hint of amber color, like I do, you know it's ready. If it's over amber, not that it's bad, it's just overdone, kind of like ripe fruit. So when you go into that harvest stage, you have to know what you're looking for. You and I had this talk a long time ago too. Um, I don't remember what show it was on. I think it was before we started the grow hour. I asked you about those red hairs make a difference. Now I had learned red hairs when they're fully orange or red. That means the, the it's ready. Also, this is before I, I had learned about trichome coloration. This is going back a very long time ago. We're talking about like nineties is how I was taught back then when I grew in the traditional market to what to look for. Now it's a totally different story. So is that still true though, too, to look for the hairs on the cannabis plant does it have to be a certain color also so that's something we could talk about also but if you have the answer now it'd be great because like i said i talked about trichomes but is the hairs make a difference too uh that it would be your strain specific or the expression of that strain um sometimes yes uh and and when you talk about the trichome coloration that's assuming that you are are harvesting for maximum thc because there are some strains out there that if you pull way later, they get a different profile. Um, they'll get you a different high. They'll get you a different everything. There's people who will say, oh, if you don't run this for 16 weeks, I think Death Star is one of them. If you don't run it for 16 weeks, it doesn't get the flavor that Death Star is supposed to have. Um, and I did that. I've done that. And with that exact cut, and it didn't, I don't think I was clever enough to recognize the difference. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like right. for me, I, and maybe I just didn't do it right, whatever it was, um, for that specific strain, but a lot of plants, you know, that's what I would go off of if you're growing it for the first time. And then if you're growing it for the second or third time, run it a little longer, just get your, your base down. You say, okay, I'm growing for THC this first time. I got 25% Amber trichomes. That's when I'm cutting it down. Next time, run it a little longer, see what you get, see if it changes a little bit on you. Um, the only reason to run it shorter, and this is all what I've heard. I don't know much about dabs making precedent anything. I've heard if you take them earlier before they amber, you get a clearer, cleaner wax. 
I don't know anything about that. I don't, I've heard people say that's not true too. I'm just letting people know it's the only reason I've ever heard somebody like, Hey, I'm going to take this before I ever see some coloration or some maturing. But yeah, I think, I think who do we have? I think Nick said that when we had him on from magic beans. And I think Turpus said that too, at certain points where it's better for rosin press than it is for just drying and curing for smokable flour. So they have, there has been mentions of that. And we're going to hopefully have a hash maker on here in the future too. That's a goal of mine. We have, we know a couple people here so that we might have on to talk about hash and rosin and stuff. Some of the stuff I like smoking. So it'd be kind of fun. So, but harvesting, drying and curing your final stage. This is where all the hard work, all the weeks of labor, all the weeks of talking to your babies, all the weeks of, of whatever you do between from when you start from Germany, to to all the way to where at this point where this is like the cradle where you cradled it man i i nurtured this 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 plant i love this plant i played it music every night now the time comes to where it's the harvesting season now whenever you plant if you're an outdoor grower you plant for the harvest of the sun and the season but if you're an indoor grower you're planting your whatever 90 day 120 day run you're running that's what you're doing. So let's talk about the first, we're going to give you some tips and tricks for leaving your garden for a period of time. Also, not just only about harvesting, drying and curing. So this is going to be a fun episode. This is like, this is my favorite part of the whole grow because like, the, uh, the first, <laughs> the first, uh, eight, you know, 12, 16 weeks, however long you're growing, you're nervous as fuck, especially if you've got one plant or two plants growing. If you got a hundred plants growing, you lose one or two yeah, it's all right. But if I got one plant grown, man, that, that, that time frame, you're like, Oh geez. Oh, oh God. what's going on? Oh, it's got one little yellow spot on the leaf. What's going on? It is. <laughs> There's so much work that entails and so much pressure because you want to have a successful harvest. But now you're at that point. Here's the harvest, harvesting and drying. So yeah, big girl, tell us a little bit about that harvesting and drying period. Yeah, and how exactly. crucial it could be, though, too, you know? Oh, it's everything. You don't, this is, if you want to cut corners, I wouldn't recommend it, but you do what you need to do. Harvesting and drying your plant is not where you want to cut corners. I'm just going to tell you that because you can grow for, you know, you got a nine, 10 week flowering period, at least four weeks before that germination. I mean, you're talking months and months of work that you can just blow in two weeks. Um, so first to get it to that harvest, right? You're coming to the end. Um, it's your last week. You think you got, you know, seven, eight days left. Um, maybe you just saw a couple of ambers pop up and you're like, Oh man, who, who knows? You're in that position, you know? So one thing a lot of people like to do, uh, is, is add cold water in their flushes. Uh, this can bring out some different colors, making your room a little colder also. Um, some people would disagree that that's a good thing. Uh, I think if you're not, at least, as long as you're not like freezing your room out, I don't, uh, I think you're just following the fall season. That's what you're mimicking, right? Like you want to mimic that fall season. So I, I don't want you to lose your train of thought, but I have a question about the cold water. I've heard uh, and seen people put ice cubes, like the final, you know, before they, they harvest like two days or something like that, or three days, they put ice cubes. Is that a thing? Is that a good thing to do or a bad thing to do? If you're in cocoa, I could see that. So it's all, you're just about to harvest. I guess it doesn't matter a ton. Um, putting it on a pea-based medium would definitely overwater in a sense. Um, if you know for sure you're cutting down, you know, and you can do that for, for sure. What I do, I use reservoirs, but I freeze one gallon jugs of water and then I drop them into my reservoirs. Oh, there you go. And then when they yeah. water, yeah. And then when they water, they just water that way. Nice. But that's just something um, I wouldn't say there's mixed messages. I think a lot of people know when you make it colder, you get colors, but maybe some people don't agree with people doing that. Now, uh, where at what point should they do that at? Like a week before they harvest or a couple of days before they harvest? I know you got to flush your plant out. I usually do it a little bit longer when I flush because I don't like just to drop gallons of water. So I usually flush for a few more days. Yeah. Uh, I know some, I've heard people do like they flush really big in like two or three days or four days or whatever. But like, when is that point where we should start doing that, adding colder water? I, I look at the whole growth phase as trans, like transitioning phases. And, and like, it's not just flower, you know, it's early flower. Then it's the transition from early flower to flower. Then it's the transition from flower to finish. 
then it's finish. Uh, I like to start transitioning about 14 days before, and I like okay. to be transitioned and flushing seven days before. Gotcha. Perfect. Nice. So, um, and that's the same way with like going from veg to flour, early flour to, to heavy flour, you know, stuff like that. <clears throat> it's a transition changing everything. Okay. So what about this? No CO2. Do you take your CO2 out before you, before you harvest or, or when do you if stop? This day? If you're indoors, you just don't need CO2 the last week or two. Um, okay. It's just, your plant won't dislike it. It just isn't, you're not blasting on flower. Now you're working on finishing your plant. So uh, you might find where you're like, well, I cut it 10 days early. Cause when I cut it 14 day, days early, for whatever reason, I didn't like it. You just, you just don't need it for the finishing parts of, of uh, your plant. Okay. So take the bag um, out. Yep. You can lower your par down a little bit. Um, you can shorten your days too, if you'd like to. So if you want to start running, you know, 10 hour days, a lot of people do that at the beginning of their flower also. Uh, not for the same reasons of like transitioning it. Uh, well, it does. Yeah, I guess it is the same reason. It's just let your plant know it's for sure flowering time. It's like, hey, you know, so if you got a tall plant and you, you're like, man, this is a really tall plant flip it in and only run 10 hours of light. It gives the plant less light to eat and grow. And it for sure lets them know it's flowering. So if, if the plant grows and then stretches in week four, do that, it'll grow and it'll get it stretch in week three. It'll save you six inches or something. Gotcha. Um, okay. Yeah. And that, that uh, the darkness before flipping kind of does the same thing. People will run 24, 40 hours of darkness. Um, I personally don't do that. I follow my my veg and my flower start at the same time but my veg runs for six hours later uh, i heard a tip somewhere i can't remember where but it's like us you know so if we're trying to transition changing our our sleeping schedule uh wouldn't would just add stress so i want to have as little stress as possible because they're already going to be stressed in a new atmosphere a new everything um their food's going to change so uh having that uh the same i like but a lot of people do 24 to 48 hours of darkness before they take it uh into actual like harvest cutting it right down. i've done that i've done 48 hours yeah and then I went people to do that too before. going into flower to make sure that their plant knows it's flowering time and then they do it again at the end um have you done it at the end i've only done it at the end yeah 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 it, uh, I, I did 48 hours one time and then i was like ah, i talk, I think i talked to you and i did 24 so yeah and i go back and forth yeah it's it's some people swear by it um i've done it before i don't know how I, it's really hard to tell if it's doing anything but i mean if you like it do it you know yeah uh, it, know it's not gonna kill if it's not gonna kill your butt you know i mean sure. <laughs> you gotta yeah, get sure, smoke out sure. of it <laughs> if anything so you can stop i've known people that will dry and cure their buds growing in their pot still and they just stop watering and then it all dries out the same and they just leave. i've never seen their flower I've instead just of ha instead of it. hanging it upside down though huh yeah they just let it go like they'll be in trellises and they just let it go um i'm not suggesting to do that we don't have that in our notes i've just heard of it um people are like oh yeah it's great but i've I've had people tell me things are great. That I mean, works. I guess it's like, I mean, every time like someone gets a bouquet of flowers though, they don't let it dry it out in their vase. They hang it upside down. Yeah. That's how you do most drying of any kind of true. veg. Well, it, it, the pot will dry out because you stop, you stop watering. Right. You just cut down. So you stop watering and then it's like you cut down tomorrow, quote unquote, when the pot oh. dries out during cocoa. Gotcha. Okay. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, I've I'm never done kind of, it. I'm um, kind of happy hour right now, so not, yeah. <laughs> not everything's making sense. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little happy hour. It is a great plant. I, I, I didn't keep it around because there's just like – I never had a room full of bangers like I have right now. Yeah. Uh, and it's, but it was you a really good fucking plant. bangers. <laughs> Dude, I've been getting lucky with my searches lately. It's been nice. Um, And we talked about it a little bit pre-harvest, but – know what you're harvesting for if you're harvesting for thc you go by the amber of the trichomes if you're you know just do maybe do a little research on the strains try to see do do your own research on the strain especially if you have your own selection of, of a strain and 
see what it does another week longer. Cold, not cold. Um, I love doing side by side. It's my favorite thing ever. It's my favorite thing to do. It's something right next to each other, as close to the same atmosphere and environment as possible. See how they're different when do this or that. You know, that's how I made my entire food schedule is by putting things by each other and saying, did this make a difference? No, it didn't. I'm not spending my money on that shit. <laughs> <laughs> so what about uh, quick tips? Like this was, we talked about this yesterday during practice and I never heard this before. I guess I never asked you either. So about harvesting, harvesting in the dark. I, I, uh, I never heard that before. Yeah. I, so I want to say again, this is not almost none of this is like a lot of stuff is things I hear from just listening to different people way smarter than me. So through those listenings, I was told that one hour before the sun comes up is when you're at the highest bricks level in your plant. And that's when you want to focus your harvest on. It made a lot of sense to me. Say, so, okay, I'll do that. Um, like I said, I'm always side by siding things and I always have this going and that going. I, I always harvested in the dark, but I've never done the hour before. I didn't notice a huge difference doing that. Um, but I've always harvested in the dark. Uh, it's just what I was always told to do. So you always want to harvest at the night cycle. I think that the having a light on in there, um, some people would maybe say no. Some people say it doesn't matter as long as it's a light cycle. Kind of something you got to figure out for yourself. But I do green lights. Um, I've been told that doesn't work. It seems like people much smarter than me doesn't think that that works at all. Uh, but I've used them. I haven't gotten herms. And I've sometimes accidentally left them on for long periods of time. Uh, and I'm not saying anything's wrong or right. I'm just saying that I'm, I'm having luck with whatever I have. You're having, you're having a, 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 I wouldn't even say luck. You're having a good experience with doing a technique that you're doing. Yeah. Even though the That's science it. seems to say, the science seems to say differently. So sometimes I, science, science is not always right. Sometimes it's right. Not everyone's, uh, it's not a hundred percent there all the time. It's not a fact, yeah. right? Yeah, there's always there's always the 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 different equate you know the the one in a million too. So maybe I just got something. Listen, I failed algebra three times because I still don't understand why fucking a plus b equals c. And I went to summer school three times and I still failed it in summer school because it never made sense in this dumb pea brain why a plus b equals c. And if anybody tries to explain it to me, I don't want to hear it because it, it doesn't make sense. So. Thank you, though, if you're going to try to out there, just like <laughs> people have been trying to explain to me there, there, and there, and it still doesn't compute in my brain because it all just makes one word to me. Everybody learns differently, everybody out there in the world. So logic's not always not always there. <laughs> it, so when you harvest in the dark, sometimes it's hard to see stuff. And if you have a trellis or something – you definitely want to use that too. Um, I do that all the time. I cut my trellis out and I like hold my plant by my trellis. It works super well. There you go. Um, uh, make sure your branches aren't crossing with others. So uh, now let me hold on a second. So that means the buds crossing, right? Like yeah. make sure the, okay. So make sure they're Before all nice and cut. spread on the, tr in the trellis up top. You get them all spread out. Nice. Yep. Right. Yep. I try to spread mine. Like initially they all have their own little area. And then I just try to part them and I cut them up all apart in the trellis and then I cut them down. And when they cut down, I just, I can do a quick flip. I can hold my trellis. I can hold the bottom of my plant. Nothing hits my tray. Nothing hits anything. I don't even touch the flower. My flower doesn't get touched by anything except for every now and again, I'll spray RO water. If I still have a residual uh, DE, on my stems because I don't want my, that powder floating all over my room. It wouldn't hurt anything. I just don't want it. It's not good to breathe in and shit. Um, but besides that, they don't get really touched or, or anything besides, besides me cleaning them up, you know? So gotcha. little movement on those flowers as possible. Um, but yeah, if you have a trellis, I love a trellis, it, it, but whatever you have, just try to try to use it is what I would say. And if you don't, then I like tying it up. I like tying it up before I cut it down. And so then you cut it down. It still holds itself up. Um, I guess it depends on how big your plants are. Some of my plants like flip over my back and shit. 
And uh, <laughs> so, you know, sometimes that stuff gets wild. So I'm trying to, you know, I don't want that hitting my hair and I don't want that. So I'm trying to hold it out as best as I can. Um, but um, prepping the area helps a lot too. So, you know, make sure things are clean. Make sure you got, uh, if you're hanging it in like a, wherever you're hanging it, make sure your lines are hung first, unless you want your shoulders to burn. If you're, if you're hanging 10 or 15 plants and you're sitting there holding it with one arm and tying a string around a bar or something with the other, and then tying that plant. And then, you know, by the time you're done with that, your arms are going to burn. Your shoulders are going to burn. And when I do you, okay. So when it comes to harvesting and you're probably going to talk about this, but, um, what I, what I've seen you do, I think I might be wrong, but I saw in your drying tent that you take the whole entire tree and pl- and hang it upside down, right? The whole thing, or do yeah, you it upside- down. I I don't. I, I've seen a lot of people do that. I'm not saying. I'm just saying I I don't have the room in my little two by four tent to put that whole plant in there, even trimming it all down. So I have to cut it. I cut like one big branch off and hang maybe like four down like that or three depending on how it looks on the on there so sorry everybody about my hands going in the in the face but uh uh, (laughs) but yeah so i mean i don't have room to do the whole entire plant so i just cut it maybe like three or four branches to it to it and then hang it that way is that that fine too i mean i've seen a lot of techniques oh yeah i think as long as you're hanging it's it's for me it's about as little disruption as possible gotcha that's really what it is to me so i'm trying to You know, from taking it down to drying it to trimming it all the way to bagging it. I'm trying to be as gentle as possible. I'm trying to keep as little knocked off as possible. Um, But so you also said, and I skipped it, and I should have I should have looked at the outline because that was one of that you were just going to talk about. That (laughs) sorry, happy hour, baby, (laughs) happy hour. Telling you, that's that's perfect because there's nothing wrong. I I've personally never seen somebody i've never seen scientists like like a, hey this is reviewed and this is what this person with a bunch of letters in front of their name says i've never seen that on full plant to to stem i'm just lazy i think how do you how do you mark your plant you said write marker on it but can someone like tie like a like a like a one of those like uh blue ribbons and you can write the, that fine too they could do oh, that yeah. Really, so I used to take its tag, wipe it off, and then cut a little slit in the side of it, and then take string around it and tie it to it, and and I just found that it's so much easier and faster, and you can't lose it. You know, you get something on there, and no matter what you tie on there or what you put on there, it's, there's, it's possible it falls off, whatever happens. If you just write it on the stem, there, it's there. You can't lose it. You can't, and I like to put that stem in the bag with it sometimes afterwards. Okay. So it marks my bags too. That's smart. But yeah. Some, it, it really just depends. Sometimes it's, you know, if it's really humid out, I won't put anything extra with it, but if it's really dry out, I definitely put a little bit of extra, especially in the tub. Um, maybe some leaves or something overnight. There you go. There you go. Yeah. But um, that's the thing to think about with the branches. Cause if you're taking down branches, you're probably trimming off the leaves first also. And some, and that's, you know, I, I personally grow a super vertical plant. And so I don't have very many leaves on mine. Most of my leaves have trikes. So I want to save it for my trim. Um, so I don't do that. But if you do have a lot of leaves that don't have trichome on it, it like it's just plant material, I would definitely suggest cutting that off before drying. And make a tea out of it. That's what I always do. None sure. of that plant should go to waste. None yeah, of it. You can do all of it. I yeah. make a plant tea, not like a tea to drink, but I soak it in water. And then I, I do it to my plants, <laughs> plants outside. Th- those water soaks are cool, uh, and it seems to be working pretty good. My lawn's looking good so far this year. Hey, so, Sharon, what are you talking about? <laughs> your plants want it, which your plants crave. <laughs> oh shit! Um, those uh, that is your. Plants are super heavy too. Don't forget that. So yeah. you have, to have some kind of support. Um, they're not going to be. I think they say you lose like ninety percent of the weight in the dry. So if you're planting on a pound, you're getting nine or ten out of it uh, hanging, um, plus the stems, all that stuff. So uh, it's pretty uh, heavy. 
So make sure you got some support to hang that from. If Maybe. you're hanging more than a few plants, you know. Yeah, I hang, I hang, I hang it on hangers, and then I have like a that big bar across the top of my tent, and I'm able to psh, boop. You know, it's great because yeah. I cure on my tent. I dry, I dry on my tent, so yeah, I don't have anywhere else to put it. So <laughs> that that warning I think comes more from when I our first harvest of CBD, and it was like, okay, we're gonna get this now. Let's figure out a dry area, and my experience up until then, a dry area. You know, I could have a tent to dry in and all that. Right. And it's like, we're looking at a quarter acre of plants. And we're like, I was like, uh, like <laughs> our, our roof of our barn will not support this. Like we need to, <laughs> like, this is not good. Uh, you know, like I'm looking at it like, this is going to be effing heavy. Um, in a tent, you're probably going to be okay. Yeah. Probably, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's worked so far. So yeah, I, I, um, I, I don't have big, like you know, big, huge, giant, enormous plants. I mean, I'm talking about like, I got three, three, four feet plants, you know? So, yeah. and once you do the trim, the way I do it, you know, the weight goes down, but it's not going to kill your bar. Trust me. If you got your lights hanging in there and you're, and, and you have your, uh, you have your airflow filter in there hanging from those bars with straps and stuff, it could hold all that. It could hold, it could hold two. Mine, I've had three plants hung in there, nice. you know? So, uh, yeah. So you're not gonna, you'll be okay. And actually, you know what, if you don't have, if you don't have room in your house, like I don't, I don't have an extra closet. I don't have extra space to that tent is actually to me, the safest place to, to, and get the proper, everything you're looking for in that tent. So it's yeah. kind of nice, whether you have an extra tent or you are not worried about turning and burning, you wait that extra, how long you, the tent actually works really nice. Yeah. I had a buddy that, that would dry in open airspace. Like he would have um probably like four or five plants at a time and he just had a big open it wasn't that big of an open area but an open area in his basement and he had a humidifier like so far like he just figured out his method and his fire nice. was really really good yeah that's out. sweet you know, yeah if you got the room you know yeah. if you got the area so yeah. you know yeah uh and then when you're finishing the plant when flushing you know i think a lot of people have their different techniques on but it's something, it's really a reading of the plant. When somebody, when you say flush for three days, flush for seven days, do this at the end, do that at the end, the whole plant growth is just the reading, is you reading that plant. So the first time you grow it, you're reading like a language you don't know. Say, so, okay, I know what this should look like. And I, I, or I know what these types of plants look like, but you don't know if it's super susceptible to light if it is going to hate too much humidity or too dry, uh, you, you don't know how, you know, if it's going to be a nitrogen whore and be just going, you're going to sit there going, Oh, why is this the only one going yellow? Um, so reading that plant is vital your whole growth cycle, but especially on the flush, if you have something in particular you're looking for. Yeah. I switched, uh, I switched to that flushing where I did it like for like two days straight, heavy water, heavy water. And I didn't like that way to do it. And I talked to you and I now do it seven straight days. Really nice. Like give it a little body. You know, I just don't, I just don't dump a bunch of water in it and just let it run out, you know, or have to take it out of the tent. And if you, I had to do that before I had to take it out of the tent cause I didn't have enough room to do what I needed to do to really flush, you know, uh, but now I just do it nice and give it that seven day flow. And I think, I think I've seen a, a better result. I, I think just yeah. not, uh, personally, I, I read my runoff generally. So if I, it's the first time I'm running a plant, I definitely read my runoff. And then if I kind of know the plant a little bit, uh, I watch my plant. And when I get to my, when I'm like, okay, I got a few days left, I'll read my runoff. Um, but generally from looking at the plant, I can tell like if there's some new green growing the last couple of weeks, I know that I have a buildup and there's high nitrogen. And so I'll start, I'll do like a little flush then Calmag and water only, maybe some hybrid. <laughs> and uh, see, I always need the Calmag guys, no matter what you do. And, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's really reading the plant. So read what other people got out of it. If it's a seed, every seed's going to be a little different. Some breeders are really good at stabilizing. Uh, sometimes it's not going to be, you know, there's going to be a, ton of different expressions and you're never going to know what yours is going to be until you grow it but 
That'd be the best tips I had for, you know, getting up to the actual dry and flush and, you know, the actual chop chop. Yep. What about drying? Like, this is crucial. Harvest is crucial. But I think drying, I, I fucked up on one of my grows. I, it over it over dried. And it was like, it, it like Hard. when you touched it, it like crystallized, like it like, it like disintegrated, like an air. Yeah. Poof. But I fixed it though, because I added some humidity to the jars, more humidity to the jars, and learned something from you. I added an orange peel to to the jars, and it wind up snapping it right back. It was didn't over moist it, but it snapped it back. It was nice. Now the fucking weed smokes phenomenal. It didn't smoke bad when it was that dry. It just didn't have the humidity set right. I was out of town for for like four days, and Mrs. Weedman wasn't paying attention that I had humidifier in there. So I got home and I was like, oh. But it was ter- it was still terpy as fuck. It's the crystals like when you open up it like diamonds because it was so dry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 people so, get a THC on a lot of their plants. Zero <laughs> percent humidity. <laughs> Shine like a diamond. <laughs> yeah, powder, powder sun. That um, you know what's super funny about that? I was reading I think today about it was like an absolute don't of curing plants or something. I was reading about cold curing. And uh, which we'll go over here in a second, but uh, and one was putting in fruit peels, and it just said it was like it has bacteria and funguses that you don't want to. Put in. And then I was like, "Fuck this article!" <laughs> but I don't, I don't do that very, very often. Well, but I, mean, I have definitely done that before. You, you could do. You taught me about using a potato peel, and I've also read that too. But you got to keep, you got to get it out of there pretty quick because it'll get shit fucked up. Uh, well, but also the, like the orange leaves. peel, the, the orange peel worked really well. Yeah. And you don't, you never want anything touching your flower. Um, typically when I do something like that, I like to have like a five gallon bucket, a turkey bag, and then I have my flower in my turkey bag and my five gallon bucket has something else in it, you know, and it's just like in the same um, area, but leaves work really well too, especially if you have that strain, throw a few leaves, like leaves of a living plant in there. Oh, nice. But I know there's probably some people freaking out, like, you don't want to ever do that with your plants. Um, but uh, Really, it's just about finding what you love and what you like. And uh, as long as it's working for you, um, I've definitely used and seen people use different types of fruit peels, different kinds of leaves. You could do the old school, the old school, the way my father used to do, like with his cigars. He, he always had a, if, if it was, if he had a humidifier box, but he, sometimes he didn't. Like he had too yeah. many cigars, and he would just take a paper towel, put it in a plastic bag, pop a hole, yeah. in the, so it wouldn't touches the the paper towel, wouldn't touches anything. You know, and just open the bag up a little bit and just and it kept, his fucking, it kept his cigars freaking phenomenal, you know, and he'd only have to he'd only have to water that that once at once every couple of weeks. He had to just put some water in there after that, you know, and on the uh, on the uh, paper towel. It worked well. Yeah, that's what uh, the they make those humidity packs. Yeah, they I saw that too. plastic bag. Yeah. And yeah. that's what I do with those when I but but I, I I felt like those gave everything kind of the same type of like taste like you could almost taste it when somebody used it really so I'm not saying anybody's wrong for using it and i'm sure if i smoked enough weed kept uh you know at the right humidity with this and that and this you could a lot of things would do that um but yeah i've uh you know i've been uh just trying to keep them in the atmosphere my basement's pretty cool and and right there at that 60 percent. so nice uh, but yeah that's uh, all those methods i i think work um but they have now a little bit of science behind the actual drying of the plant. Um, so what I try to get closest to, I should say, and uh, the first step, especially I don't, I can't get close to, but they say the first 12, 24 hours, 30% humidity, 60 degrees. This is ideal. This is what, and the, the, so the first 12, 24 hours, you want it a little drier. And they say that this stops, you know, it stop, it dries the moisture enough to stop a lot of the bacteria and funguses um, that are constantly you know, on everything going around doing, you know, any, anything that would be grown in there. It slows down the water activity, I believe is what it's called enough to stop a lot of that. So if you have, especially like a large flower, dense, something that's prone to root, getting, getting rot, root rot, or not root rot, bud rot. Um, something like that, being able to drop it that 30% just to the 30% just for the first half day to day could help you with that possibly. 
Um, but then after that, the, the 60, 60 rule, you try to do the 60%, 60 degrees as close as you can. Um, I can Mrs. tell you Weed my room, never Mrs. 60 degrees. Mrs. Weedman would hate it. If I had to turn this yeah. air conditioning down to 60 degrees. <laughs> well, the cold water hopefully can do some of, I mean, that's when it's growing, you know, but hopefully yeah, the cold water doesn't do I get my ass whooped if I ever put it down that low. <laughs> Dude. I can't. I my AC would not can't do it. So it's uh, then it's more of the thirty percent is what's harder for me to get to. But the sixty degrees is just like I wouldn't be able to afford the the power bill on my AC. Yeah, exactly. But um, and then so let me look on here real quick. Sorry. So you do that first day of 12, 24 hours, the 30% ideally, then you have 10 to 14 more days at the 60, 60, you trim it as fast as you can. You get it bagged up and you burp it daily. Some people say a month, some people say two months as, as I think you, you can, that's pretty strange specific also. Um, I think, you know, if, as long as you're burping it for it's dried for it's two weeks, you're burping it. Uh, a month, you're pretty good, I think, usually. But do it for two months. Do it as long as you can. You know, if you got 15 strains, that's not a super fast thing. You know, that's 15 jars you're opening, 15 bags you're opening, whatever it is. Yeah, that's not fun. <laughs> every day, yeah, every day. Some some people do it twice a day. So uh, I do I do not do a super long burp. I generally let it breathe for a second and then just kind of, you know close it back up. I just want to exchange the air. Do you give the jar a little shake, a little like movement, like just to get the airflow going through the buds a little bit too? Like, yep. do you give it sure like, I, I try to like get... what I do is I just take the jar and I turn it and just let it roll a little bit. I don't want to shake. You don't want to shake it because yeah. you'll lose all the good stuff, but cool. I just give it a nice little roll at the buds. Like, so they're not sticking so the air can flow a little bit better. Is that, is that good to do? Yeah, I think so. Um, you, you always want to be as gentle as possible, but getting airflow in between all those flowers, not having them stick together, Stuff like that is huge in my experience. Um, yeah, that's why you don't stuff it. You don't stuff yeah. that jar to the fucking hilt. Twenty five percent at least left in every single jar is what you want. Uh, at least some, some you might, you know. But um, so t- talking to the curing, um, you want it dark, airtight. Uh, you want it cooler. You still want the sixty sixty. Uh, you don't want plastic. Um, and I was actually talking to somebody today. Literally, uh, they said something about having it in turkey bags uh, and I like turkey bags. Um, it is technically a plastic. I think they're nylon. Um, but you know what? Turkey bags are super good for decarboxylating your weed and not making your, your house smell like weed. I heard you guys talking about that. I think not long ago, we did. But you can tie them in a turkey bag and, uh, decarb your weed in there. But, um, that's what I like to use because I can have my five gallon bucket with this little gamma lid. I put my bags in there, tied tops. And when I burp them, I can have, you know, three or four of them in one five gallon bucket, take them out, burp them, put them back in there. And I get, keep really, really good flavor. Um, it, it cures really well. Now, before I go, you said not plastic. I see people yeah. and I see companies and I haven't done this yet. Uh, Mylar bags is a big thing now. They're reusable. Yeah, but a lot of people are curing their weed in mylar bags because it's a little bit easier. But it, it meaning like they have room for it compared to buying thirty-two ounce jars or five gallon buckets. Is yeah. that good to do, or is it? I mean, do you know anything about that? I know I, I'm throwing you a little curveball here, a little slider, but I just I just thought about it in my my happy hour brain. You know, I I see a lot of people not liking them. Um, and I don't know. It would be the, the quickest answer. I, I I personally would, if I could get away from the turkey bags, I would, you know, if I could get, but finding glass jars, you know, and then like, those, that's giant glass jars, you know? And so it's like, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, if I could get like 200 of those, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I can make that happen. Actually, actually, uh, we are, we're going to get the 32 ounces for sale here. Sorry. That's I'm not trying to throw a plug at the, we, no, on either. our next order, we're going to order bigger ones. So breeders and growers can have the bigger, cause those, those, like, those what would a five gallon bucket size one be? 
I don't know about that. I don't think they make oh. them that big, but 32 ounces is probably the biggest we can get. So at least you can get like your, you know, take the, take the stuff you don't need out of the five gallon bucket anymore. And that's your personal, nice 32 ounce right behind you. And you're, when you're working on your station, <laughs> I have a great rotation with your jars. So I keep the biggest one. I have all three sizes and then one of the small and two of the smallest ones. Yeah. I love the, I love them all. The stash ones my, is cool. one of my faves. Cause I can take that with me everywhere I go. <laughs> you yeah, it's smell proof too. too. Yeah. So yeah. I love them. So yeah, yeah we're going to be having the, we're going to have the 32. I'm glad you like them. That makes me happy. Yeah. I know a few people that really like them. I get a lot of compliments on them, but yeah, the 32 ounce ones will be coming too for, for growers to, to, and home growers to, to cure their, their cannabis in. So their weed in. So, yeah. Yeah. I love my rotation I have with it. I, I put my favorite weed that I have at the moment in the biggest one, keep that one stocked up the most. This medium sized one, I put my rarest weed, what I don't have the most of. And then the two littlest ones are like my daily smoke ones. So I pick out a couple strains for the day. Take them out of my turkey bags in the five gallon buckets. I love it. And put it into those. So I love my little rotation, but I do, I do need to get some more. Yeah. I'll get you. We'll get you when we order them. So, uh, yeah, what about, um, uh, so I, I keep, when I cure, I actually got a special spot in my house and I love it there. And I think we've talked about this. When it comes to the cool area, I have a little space in my basement that's like where my gas line is at. Like, and it's not it's even used. Cold. The gas line's not even used anymore because it's all outside. So now it's perfect. So, in this area, it's not drywalled in, it's still got concrete floor, brick, exposed brick. It stays 62 to 65 degrees in there all year round. And I get like 50, 48 to like 52% humidity. Like all year round. Lovely. Perfect. Yeah. Love it. So, so is that a good little spot for my, for my, for my, my curing and where I keep my store, all my, 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 my goodness. Yeah. Perfect. As close to 60, the 60, 60 rule is what I follow at all drying and curing. Um, Some people want it a little drier than that when they're curing and really getting that butt out at the end. Um, I don't usually, you know, uh, but you know, I, I think a lot of people like the 55% humidity packs is the reason I would say that, but, um, I throw I a few in there. 60. Nice. And, yeah. Uh, it's a perfect yeah. little spot, man. I, <laughs> I'm so lucky to have that as the, the, the best thing about this whole basement. It's so hard. It's so hard. The, the, where I grow at my little spot where I grow, it's terrible, dry, you know, the, you got to play with the fucking thermometer all the time, but that spot in my corner, of the perfect. studio basement studio is perfect. It, I have not had an issue in, in nice. since I've been, so it's been great. I yeah. smile about that little area. <laughs> Find yourself Tell, the spot. So that's, so the cold cure though, is that would would you consider that a cold cure? So cold cure is something I've recently found out about. Never done. Very interesting. Goes against what some people have said for a long time. But basically what that is, is you dry and you cure normal. Once you get to the state where you're like, okay, this is cured. So you dried it for two weeks. You've been curing it for six weeks, right? Two months after you harvest. You got more weed than you can smoke right now. You know, you got your ounce or two out. You say, fuck, I grew six because I'm smashing. I've been listening to this grow hour and smashing. (laughs) So true. And you say, what? I don't want, how am I going to preserve these terpenes? How am I going to? This cold cure could be the answer. And basically all they do is cured where you need it to be, everything perfect, throw it in a jar, throw it in your fridge. That was it. Keeps it pretty constant and same temperature. And supposedly, this is what I've seen people post about, you know. So I didn't read this anywhere. I just seen people say, oh, look at this. This terpene content is still fantastic. But they say for over a year. Which is crazy. I, I need. I'm gonna try it for sure because just burping, like curing and burping, I get like six months, and I start to lose my terpene content, uh, whether I burp or don't burp. Um, but I can get six months, you know, out of it for sure. So, which is enough time usually. Nice, nice. So All right. Look up cold cure if you if that interests you. Just and- don't put it in the freezer because your freeze try comes right off. Yeah, don't so, want the freezer. And no you want to disturb it as little as possible, I was told, on the cold gear. 
or I read. I wasn't told anything. I read it. Well, try it. I mean, you got it. Like I said, even if you did it like two ounces and you put or an ounce and you tried it and see how it came out, you never know. Experiment. Have some fun. You might found something new that works for you. This peanut butter breath that I'm just pulled down, bro. Uh -huh. I know you like it. The number three. So I, I kept three of them out of like five or six females for different reasons. And this number three, I think, is just it just got better. It got better with its generation from seed. Oh, that peanut butter breath. Well, I got that. one rolled up right here, but I, I don't <laughs> ready for the night. out for the count with that bad boy right yeah. there. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that uh, I have, like, I have two nugs left, and I'm like, not. Nah, I'm just pacing. They're myself. curing out really well still. I don't know if you noticed yeah. that. But mine are getting turpier and turpier still, which is really Maybe nice. Three kisses on that one. <laughs> we can. Right. One. The one thing that every grower gardener <laughs> hates when they're in the middle of a grow and they want to go on vacation or they want to go on a trip and they have to ask someone to watch it for them. Or Easter's coming up and they have to <laughs> yeah. figure it out. So, what, what do you do, man? I mean, this is like, I, I mean, even as much as I trust Mrs. Weed, man, I still that little seed of doubt, like, cause it is I, here. All right. I'm going to give you all an example when you have a very strong person you live with. Okay. I have a habit of always reminding her two or three times about something. I know her very well, been with her almost 30 years and she forgets because she has a lot of thing on her plate. And I, even when she, sometimes she writes it down because she has 50 bazillion note papers around for work and for eight decades and for life and for this but I'm like, hey, I'm going out of town for 24 hours. I need you to do this, this, this with the plant. Okay, this is all I need to do. Yes. Did you write it down? I got it. I know what to do. Okay. All right. So in about an hour, you're going to have to go water the plant because the light's going to be on. I need you to go water the plant, check the humidifier, and make sure it's filled. Four hours, five hours later, I get to my destination. I call. Hey, Mrs. Weedman. <laughs> and I don't want to do it. I, I want to believe. I want to trust. I want to fucking have faith, not have to ask her uh, three times. First time, an hour or two before I go. Second time before I leave. And there's always a fucking third time when I get down to my destination and I call and tell her where I'm at. I'm like, hey, how you doing? I used to be like, hey, did you check the plant? Now I talk for like two minutes and then I go, hey, did you get the plant? I fucking forgot. Dude. That's a good tip for anybody in any relationship ever right there. You got, <laughs> if you got something to say that's going to maybe piss somebody off or like inquire about something, uh, talk about something else for a second first and make it sound like you weren't calling just because of that. That's it. That's good. it. But it, it, I, I used to just call right away and be like, yo, get the plant. One out of every five times she said, yeah, I got it. So, so just think about that. How many times I go out of town? All right. And I, I'm biting my nails and I know she's not going to ruin it because I, I, you know, yeah. it's only five hours, but it's the point was having somebody you could trust to watch your grow while you're out of town. And I'm sure there's horror stories, hundreds, maybe thousands of horror stories about this. Sure. So, oh, yeah. Especially <laughs> so, when you have large, like when you have a larger garden yeah. and you, you like, not, not like, like when you have like a, you know, barn. And you're doing a whole barn with your family. Like, what do you freaking do on Easter when you're all at the same celebration at the same times in the same place and everybody's letting you know? So um, leaving the garden for a trip or something is definitely – there are some little tricks. You know, uh, if you have a reservoir, probably doesn't bother you quite as much because you can have machines do things for you. Um, and if you don't have a reservoir, it's a little different. So, um, if you have a reservoir, you know, you can put your, everything on a timer, do that stuff during the day. We talked about that before. Um, naturally, anytime you have water sitting, uh, you want to first off be aerating it for sure, or, or circulating it somehow. Um, but it's going to try to get neutral. It's going to try to get to seven. So, um, sometimes if you have something weird in it, it'll go over or under, you know, fungus dominated, bacterial dominated, uh, is different, but typically it tries to get to seven. And when, so you, your plant 
if you're in soil, likes a six, five, maybe, maybe you want to go a little higher. I wouldn't, um, if you're in cocoa, you can go down below the sixes. So just predict that, uh, red pH or reservoir low and predict, Hey, I'm going to be gone for this amount of days. Even if you have somebody coming in looking, just predict it. I do that, uh, on everything. Really. I try to predict any possible problem so that somebody else doesn't have to deal with it because no matter who it is, the most beautiful, fantastic people in the world don't care about your garden as much as you do. So, and that's nothing again, you know, it's just what it is. It's, it's, you know, it's just what it is. Same reason nobody cares about your kid as much as you do. Like, <laughs> it's your little baby. <laughs> but, uh, so if you're hand watering though, that leaves you less options because you don't, you know, so one thing you, you have hand watering is typically you're not in a medium that needs the constant watering. So if you're running a reservoir, you might be in, you know, uh, like a, like a Grodan, a rock wool. Uh, that is scary as fuck to leave because you get a pump to clog for one night and your plant will die. If you know, like, Nope. They are not very forgiving or like even a real hydro, you know, like not very, for, or that is a real hydro, but even like a straight water hydro kind of, you know, co uh, I think it's called current culture systems. Um, they're not super forgiving, but if you're in, you know, pro mix, a peat moss based medium, and you might be able to leave your plant for three or four, you know, your, your plant, if you just transplanted in something like that, you might have seven, eight days before you got to water again. So if you're hand watering, sometimes if you time it out right, that can help. But if you're in the middle of flower, I guarantee if you're only watering once every seven days in the middle of flower, you can do something different probably. Um, because typically how I like flower is I want it to be like, I'm just force feeding this thing as much as possible. So, um, you know, if you're in like a big living soil kind of thing. I could see maybe something like that because everything is so balanced and you're getting so much help from biology. But if you're running salts and, and a stagnant kind of condition, that would be crazy. I would, I, I would, you, you could go down in a pot size. Um, <laughs> but um, if you are hand watering and you do need somebody to water for you though, pre-mix your nutrients, put them in a five gallon bucket or whatever you, you're going to need to water get a, you know, make sure it gets agitated somehow. Um, water pH is low, like we just talked about and put, make sure the nutrient level, you put it in there low because water will evaporate. Your nutrients will not. So if you have a five gallon bucket sitting there with five gallons and you have it at a, you know, 2.0 EC and you're saying, okay, this is what I want. This is my flower flip or whatever and this is what i want to water well in three days that's going to be four and a half gallons and if you have a lot of circulation maybe even less and you're going to have that same amount of salt so then you're going to be you know looking at a whatever that is equivocally you know like a 2.3 or a 2.4 ec and that probably isn't terrible um but then if you, you know if, if you're trying to get through two waterings then all of a sudden you're like you're you know just predict that you're going to lose water circulating um, also what you can do, say you usually water every three days and you're saying, fuck, you're like I need to go out of town. I'm going out of town for four days, but I watered every three days, less two waterings. It's possible. This is two days this time. I'm, I'm noticing I need to water, um, over water. This sucks. One over watering isn't going to, uh, isn't ideal, but if you don't have anybody watch your garden, you know, that watering before you leave over water it a little bit, water it two days in a row, right before you leave. And, uh, your plant's not going to die. It's not going to be super happy about that. But if you have a really happy plant, you might not even notice a difference. Um, but it will get you that extra day. It'll kind of stunt your root growth a little bit and cause things to be a little more wet. Um, it generally will get you that extra day. I should say, not always. Everything's a little different. These are just suggestions or things that I've done personally. The flooding thing, I've even flooded a, a table. I put a table where the water was like a half inch up to the bottom of my pots. And I said, okay, I'm predicting that in two days, three days, 
this will be evaporated enough where my pots aren't just sitting in water. So I was gone. I can't remember how, how long. And I came back and the water level was under where my pots were soaking up, but my pots were all still wet. Um, a couple of plants weren't as happy as I like them, but they, they got through it. That's, it's about surviving, you know. <laughs> Survival of the fittest right there. It's about surviving, yeah. Yeah, if you got some plants that you're, well, you're like, man, I don't know what pheno to run on this. Just stress the shit out of them. Overwater them like that. You'll, you'll see. What about the last thing to do to you once you're done, the cleaning? I scrub. Scrub-a-dub-dub in the tent. Yeah, and it's uh, so cleaning, in, in my experience, is much more important before you leave somewhere than when you're even done with a run. Because you want to go through, you want to make sure your lines are clean. Usually I blow out all my lines. I use octobubblers, which is like an eight-site area where I can control my flow, but I don't. Um, wild man. Uh, but I get in there and make sure there's no like build up in there. I'll scrub out in there a little bit. Sometimes if depending on what I'm running on that particular tray, I'll add like a zero tall, which is like an H2O2. Try to clean out my lines. Um, try to clean, I'll clean all my filters. Um, you know, blow out all my drains and all my, like everything. I'll go through like clean my, everything I can. Uh, because when you're gone is when that stuff's going to break. Gotcha. Yep. Your pumps, everything. But, and really, uh, I'm super lucky too, because I have somebody back here where if we do have a problem, so he, what I like, I have a system where my, I have a camera that I can see on my phone and I set up my temperatures in front of it. So I can read my, when I'm not home, I don't know if this makes me crazy. Now that I'm saying it, uh, I'm thinking maybe I'm sounding crazy, but when I'm, when I'm not home, I can get on my, my security system and I can look at the temperature in my bedroom, two temperature spots in my flower room and the temperature in my breeding tent. That's not crazy. Dude, you gotta, you gotta understand something though. I mean, somebody like myself that I'm a home grower, I grow for me and give out to my friends and family and my loved ones. But you are a caregiver. You ha you actually are growing medicine for people that, and it's a it's a harvest. It's a room. It's everything. You are growing medicine for people. You have to make sure your grow area is exactly how you need it to take care of it, to love it, to guard it, to guide it, to plant it, to harvest, curing, drying, smoking, whatever. It's just the point is you're not crazy at all. You're you're that's your this is your this is your business your job your your passion this is what you do and you also make sure those the people you take care of have the best quality medicine that they can get from a caregiver which you're growing personally for them so there's a care that's why it's called a caregiver that's why it's such an amazing program why this, every state should allow it not just let dispensaries and cultivators you know cultivation make all the money it should be able to people to provide a service that they can do out of their own home right and be able to yeah. make a good living and be able they to shouldn't put a limit on it either. I don't think I not think at all. Crazy that. Thing. So you no can have five patients. Like, well, what if I can take care of 50 people? Why are you, you should be able to hundred fucking percent? People? Cause that, but the, yeah. see, that's the thing because you can, it's affordability to you start your own. At that point. Yeah. It's affordability to start out of your own fucking home. You could take your whole basement. You could provide for your family. You can make a good living. You got 25 patients, 40 patients, 50 patients. And that, but, but that's all you want. You yeah, want like, to, and, and you're making a great living. It's fucking brutal, dude. Every state should do the caregiver program and it should be a licensed business that you can run out of your home. That you can write your home off. You get tax breaks. You're running it as a business. You're, you're a 1099, whatever. And you hire one employee. Now you've got a business an LLC and you're at now participating in what you're owning your own business is all about what this country was founded on. So every state should do it. That's why we talk about stopping the stigma. We talk about freeing this plant more. So everybody, this plant can be made. Not everybody's gonna be able to grow their own weed. But to have me to be able to supply 50 people or 25 people with good, great, good cannabis that I'm working with with local breeders too to buy their phenos. Now I'm supporting their home businesses too because I, I'm not going to be a breeder. I don't want to be a breeder, but I want to fucking grow for people and I could stay home and make a living. Fuck yeah, dude. It shouldn't be allowed. Awesome. It should be allowed. And this is what the, this podcast, what the Chronicles stands for, freeing the plant, being able to grow your own medicine. And why not start a business? And if we as people of this country 
do not fight for certain things, we'll never get it. And just corporations yeah. will take over. And next, you know, you're going to see it all, peeps. Just don't, I'm, I don't need to be preaching to the choir, but you're going to see it where it's going to come down to maybe five big companies owning it all. And it's just, and then we didn't stick up for ourselves. We didn't talk about it. And it'd be like a year from now, well, I didn't know that happened. Well, fucking A, you got to figure it out. You got to fucking read and watch the news and fucking do shit and fight for what you want or else it'll never happen. They're, they're pretty good at, at, their side of of facing a, I don't know if you call it a stigma or what because I've had conversations with people where they're like well you know the dispensaries you know we need the dispensaries and we need this and that and it's like listen man you you guys aren't even seeing a point here the point is it can be better the point is we're just starting a lot of this shit why aren't we starting it better why aren't we doing it better why are we keep doing this dumb shit this like we have how many states now that we can look at and be like, let's learn from them. And, and it's, instead, it's yeah. like, no, nope, we're just going to keep feeding the same big right. dollar and, and the same companies are coming. And, and I get on these rants. There are good companies out there. And there yeah, 100%. Are- There's really good dispensaries out there. I love the mom and pop dispensaries. I'm a mom and pop guy. Yeah. I'm a mom and pop business guy. This country was founded on small business owners, I believe, in the small. Yeah. So anybody that's a one or two or three store dispensary owner, mom and pop shop, family owned, family run business, takes care of their employees, treats their employees like family. I'm 100% like love you, hug you, squeeze you, give you smooches. <laughs> love it. I am not a corporate guy. Never have been, never will. Oh, it's not about the man. So I want to know the person that owns it. Like if I, if, if, if somebody's working there, I want them to know the people that own it and run it. And, and I want them, to, you know, I don't, it, I don't know. Like, like you said, it's the thoughtless, large corporation stuff. That's really kind of just like disheartening. I've been, I've been to a lot of dispensaries and now since it's, the States have going are going legal. I've been to a lot. And one of my favorite dispensaries, favorite, 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 favorite. And there's a lot that I can say, but this one is one of my faves. It's Med Farm in in Oklahoma, in Tulsa, family owned. The owners are phenomenal people. The employees, the people that are like family, the nurse practitioner they have making edibles for them on site, phenomenal. The Slurpees with with the ice cream in it that are 50 milligrams, knock you on your ass. Nice. But there's just certain ones that I'm a mom and pop guy, you know, and I think I think be able to be a caregiver, which is my wife and I can run or your partner and you can run a home grow business for people and have 10, 15, 20, 30 clients, patients. It doesn't I think it even should be for rec too. Like you should have 50 people that can buy from you. You're 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 weighing your stuff, you're 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 paying your taxes like you're supposed to, but you're charging a fair price for really good weed and they know they can come to you at any time and pick up, smoke a joint with you in your basement, look at your grow, look at the flowers if they want, whatever, you know, just it's more of a personal, it's, it's a personal experience. It's, it's an effect that's so much better. And I'm going on a rant. I'm sorry. I'm over the grow hour hour, but I'm, I'm trying to prove a point that this is, should be for everybody that wants to get in and not yeah. just be for the people that have money. No, yeah, I should and it, you know, how did that? Here's the perfect example. Michigan started as a caregiver program. There was no dispensaries. There was at the time, right? There was no c- major big cultivators. No, well, caregivers got together and they made uh, co. Do they call them co-ops? I can't remember what they call. I think them. it was a co-op. Yeah, they still have them. Some of them up here, um, but even further than that, the dispensaries up here relied. The dispensaries when they first opened relied on caregivers. Yep. As a caregiver, they said, hey, for a temporary amount of time, caregivers can sell their product to dispensaries. So a lot of these caregivers had like gardens rented out. Like it wasn't a basement thing. It was still following 72 plants. It was still all by the book. And they could sell their overages to the dispensaries. And so there's a couple crazy things about that. One, they couldn't write anything off. So they like, they're all like, at least that's what I was told. I didn't do it that way. So I didn't have, I don't have a very big warehouse, never have all that kind of stuff, but that you couldn't write off. Like usually a business would be able to write off different, like, like utility bills. And yeah, there's a bunch of different, a bunch of different write-offs you can do when you own a business. Zero write-off. And, um, I think their taxes were, were kind of large, but they supplied, uh, dispensaries for, 
Not just a little while for a, Man, a that's while. When get, that's when dispensaries in Michigan were getting fucking phenomenal weed. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then no, no, I'm saying the weed isn't isn't good now, but you were getting yeah. like uh, primo, like better than cult, major cultivation weed. That's all I got to say. Because the weed I smoke from you is better than any cultivator I've had in Illinois. Sorry to say that, but it's true. Well, thank you. But it's it's yeah it's it's you know it's when you get out what you put in. And so yeah. Hundred percent. So this is what we have to keep on fighting for. And if you have a voice, which we do, I'll keep on talking that way because I've, I've said it before and I'll say it again. We all have a fucking shot at this, and it just all depends on how we work it or not. So um, this was a good episode, man. The yeah, happy hour, man. Yeah. Happy hour. Woo. Yeah. Woo. Love it. Yeah, I like it too. <laughs> I shouldn't have gotten rid of that one, but we got seeds. That seeds coming across to the Uncle John's headband. So I need to look. Right there you go. You got anything else to say, big girl, before we go? Not, not much. Um, I think we've covered pretty much everything. Uh, if you are having a problem um, cutting anything down or getting anything dry to write, um, if you got a five-gallon thing of uh, CalMag and you dump it in there, you give it like a dunk, um, <laughs> it's an instant cure and dry. So. <laughs> Hey everybody out there, don't forget the cow mag. Smoke some big fat doinks all. Peace. <laughs> <laughs>